Hey, uh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is uh, day two of the Global Youth Forum on Climate Change. Uh, my name is uh, Dinesa Rodrigo and I work as the policy analyst and knowledge content developer at Slack and Trust. Um, thank you again for everybody who's uh, joined us today. Um, and uh, I also want to extend um, a thank you to everybody who joined uh, our ye yesterday's sessions as well. It was great to have uh, as much participation as we did, and I'm sure that everybody um, enjoyed um, interacting with us, you know, getting involved in the Q&A sessions and also the group work sessions that we had as well. So, and for those who are joining us today for the first time, fear not, I will be uh, doing a quick re recap before we start our main session for the day today, uh, uh, which will be commencing in uh, about 10 minutes. So um, yeah, I, I'll just share my screen and start my recap. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, today uh, we have uh, a lot of sessions lined up and I'm looking forward to uh, engaging with all of you, especially youth participants and ev everyone who can join our uh, group uh, uh, sessions that we have, which I will get onto in a minute. So just to recap yesterday on uh, what happened, we started off with a welcome address by Ms. Voshita uh, Vijay Naika, who's the executive director at Slyke and Trust. Uh, this was swiftly followed by our session on resilience, foresight and transformation. Uh, in this, we had a keynote speech from Dr. Youssef Nassif, uh, who is the director in the adaptation division at the UNFCCC. We also had a training session conducted by Mr. Harold Knight, uh, Neidhart, who is the curator and CEO of uh, Future IO Institute, uh, followed by an interactive session uh, led by Ms. Habiba Al-Khatib, uh, who's the convener at uh, Youth Resilience Frontier. And we also had a little insight to um, uh, international legal framework surrounding, um, you know, uh, relating to resilience, foresight and transformation, including um, some insight into the legal weight framework for uh, uh, big data and access, open access to information as well. This was uh, done by Dr. Abir Hadid, Haddad, sorry. Um, then this session was followed by our session on youth in climate action uh, for which Ms. Flo Newman uh, delivered a keynote speech. Uh, uh, Ms. Flo Flohman is the unit lead at, uh, for gender at ACE in the UNFCCC. And this, this was then followed by an interactive session that we had with uh, all the participants um, and um, also uh, viewers for uh, who submitted a project proposal. And so, you know, we, we gave a platform for those who submitted a proposal to give a one minute presentation and followed by a Q&A session on their uh, proposals, which went really well. We had a lot of participation and interaction as well. Um, then this was followed by a um, session on in initiating climate action. We had uh, amazing, uh, an amazing panelist, including Mr. Chibizi, Dr. Bremley, uh, Ms. Aish and uh, Mr. Raphael. Uh, and within this um, session, we also had a 30 minute group breakout session, which is working on uh, who worked on um, the project proposals according to the four thematic areas that we're focusing on, which is uh, uh, climate change and disaster risk, uh, sustainable food systems, biodiversity and oceans and eco uh, coastal ecosystems. I'll get onto that uh, in a minute. So next, I just want to go through a few of the highlights in each of the uh, sessions that we had. So we, uh, in resilience, foresight and transformation, um, it was noted that, you know, foresight requires us to develop a preferred vision for the future and work out how this can be achieved. Young people today are markedly ambitious and innately suited to this optimistic and creative task. We also talked and uh, touched upon climate risks, future of cities, climate action and climate data. 
uh, plastic waste and biodegradable, um, biodegradable materials. And also we looked at the relationship between climate scenarios and uh, climate architecture, climate models, moonshot thinking, uh, exponential technologies and urban resilience. And finally, we also touched upon uh, the drivers of uh, change in the resilience frontiers, which included uh, artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, uh, biotechnology, satellite technology, and the emerging sustainability ethos. Uh, in our session on youth in climate action, it was noted that you know everyone, especially youth and vul uh, vulnerable communities are affected by the impacts of climate change. Uh, the voices and ideas of youth must be taken into account when initiating climate action and climate change uh, environment and sorry and climate change and environmental education training and public awareness should be expanded. Um, Ms. Floor uh, Newman also highlighted the fact that uh, education programs on climate change uh, are important, uh, especially for the broader public, including youth. And these are one of the most relevant and effective instruments to help uh, reduce the level of greenhouse gas emissions and to promote sustainable lifestyles. Uh, it is impor also important to work together and act on climate change. And for this, uh, multi-stakeholder participation in climate action is important, as well as uh, enthusiastic youth engagement uh, to ensure fair and just climate resilience for all. And finally, on our session on initiating climate action, it was noted that youth are key stakeholders in climate action and uh, are future decision makers. Engaging them in climate uh, change adaptation is not only a matter of uh, intergenerational justice and equity, but also brings uh, great benefits stemming from their skills, perspectives, and innovations that will drive and shape uh, adaptation action in the decades to come. Focal areas uh, for youth engagement include awareness creation and training, capacity building and empowerment, participation in decision making processes, youth led adaptation and climate mitigation action, as well as uh, advocacy so that youth can become climate and action ambassadors and intergovernmental climate change negotiators. And finally, we also touched upon, uh, you know, the fact that um, uh, on uh, committing to the adoption of youth engagement strategies, developing frameworks for youth uh, engagement, adopting youth oriented uh, communication channels for the dissem dissem dissemination of information and conducting climate risk assessments on the effect of climate change on youth. So um, I would also just like to touch upon our um, uh, project proposals that were submitted. So we had a number of projects uh, proposals, which we shortlisted to 14. These were then put up for voting on our uh, webpage for the global, uh, global Youth Forum on Climate Change. And voting ended yesterday and eight uh, project proposals were selected two under each of the four thematic areas uh, that we're focusing on. Uh, and uh, these project proposals based, the, these two project proposals basically made the basis for the group discussions that we had uh, going forth. So I would just quickly like to take you through um, uh, each of the um, uh, themes that we have in the project proposal that were selected. So under biodiversity, we had, um, a project proposal called Biodiversity Check and One Tree and One Student. Uh, under Oceans and uh, Coastal Ecosystems, we had a project which was focusing on community-based adaptation, mangrove restoration and campus awareness, and also uh, a project proposal on saving the oceans. Uh, under Climate Change and Disaster Risk, we had a project proposal on the circular economy for waste management and clean coasts. And finally, under sustainable food systems, we had a project proposal which focused on uh, permaculture for food security and nutrition, self-employment and healthy lives, as well as a project proposal titled No More Seasonal Fruits and Vegetables Wastage. So on to today's sessions that we have. So uh, following this recap, we will be having 
a session on ecosystem conservation and addressing climate change, which is going to focus on uh, biodiversity, oceans, and coastal and marine ecosystems. So for this, we have Dr. Tani Kumar, who's the general manager of uh, Marine Environmental Protection Authority in Sri Lanka. We have Mr. Lucas Ed Bauer, who's an alumni from the United Nations University in the Institute for Environment um, and uh, Human Security. And we also have Ms. Voshita Vijayanaika, who's the executive director at Slike and Trust. Uh, we also, please note that we also have a few other sessions lined up for today as well. So um, we have a session on incorporating climate and disaster risk management into actions, which will be uh, starting at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Central European time or 4, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, India Standard time. Uh, then we have a session on youth in national and global policy process and sustainable se sessions, which will be uh, happening from uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time and 6.30 to 8.30 IST. And finally, we also have two keynote speakers who will be talking on climate resilience and uh, transformative building for post-COVID-19, which will be happening from 4.30 to 5.30 uh, CET and 9 to 10 p.m. Uh, IST. So I hope that everybody who's joined today's session will be able to make it for uh, the other sessions that we have lined up today. Also note that we also have uh, two group discussions as well under incorporating climate and disaster risk management and uh, youth in national and global policy processes, which, um, uh, which will be uh, developing the uh, project proposals that were chosen. So please, if you're interested in this, uh, join us. Uh, your participation will be uh, well appreciated. Um, and yeah, so for more information, please visit visit our website, www.slikeandtrust.org. Uh, please go to the events page for Global Youth Forum on Climate Change, where we'll be, you'll be able to find out more information on uh, the agenda for all of our sessions, as well as the project proposals. and. Um, more information on uh, this forum itself. So with that, I'm going to conclude my um, recap. So now we can uh, start on today's session, which is on uh, ecosystem conservation and um, addressing climate change, focusing on biodiversity, oceans and coastal ecosystems. Um, as I said, we have uh, three amazing uh, panelists joining us, uh, guest speakers joining us today, uh, including uh, Dr. Tani, uh, Mr. Lucas, and Ms. Voshita. So just to start everything off, if I could ask um, each of them to uh, introduce themselves, give a bit of background on who they are, and like maybe how your work relates to um, the uh, thematic session uh, for today. Thank you. So if I could start with maybe Mr. Lucas, as I see you have your uh, video on. Hi, sorry, um, Ms. Lucas, you're still on um, mute, sorry. Okay. Good great. morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me now. I'm joining from Germany and um, in the background, you can already see a, an image I have taken last year. And um, what you can see is the Bedangana Wetland Park in Colombo, just as a short teaser. So um, my background is disaster risk management and I've just graduated this year at the United Nations University focusing on climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. At the moment, I'm working um, for the German government on disaster risk reduction still, but also for a short um, initiative focusing on how we can make tourism more resilient to climate change. Um, yes, so I'm looking forward to, to, to this session today and hoping to give you some interesting insights to my research. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, maybe Dr. Tani, you could go next. Thank you. Yes, Tinitra, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yes. That's good. And uh, welcome for, to Colombo. And I'm from actually, I'm from MIPA Marine Environment Protection Authority. And I am uh, a marine scientist and my base, uh, background is coral reef ecology. At, but at present, I am working as a general manager or chief executive officer for Marine Environment Protection Authority, where we control all the marine pollution in Sri Lanka, 
in Sri Lankan waters and again uh, marine environment protection comes under our purview. So uh, lots of issues with marine pollution in, in uh, with us at the same time, lots of issues with climate change and how, how climate change impacts on our sea grasses, so mangroves, so uh, our coral reefs. So hope to discuss a few ideas with you within my 15 minutes time and, and then I will we'll discuss more during the uh, discussion forum and maybe hope to meet Lucas and and, and uh, others maybe soon, maybe in Colombo, Zambia. Uh, face-to-face uh, -face and discuss um, in more, in more lengthy our way. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, great to have you as well, Dr. Tani. Um, now, finally, can I have Ms. Voshita to um, introduce herself as well? Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Voshita Vijayanayaka. I work as the Executive Director of Slyke and Trust. I will be speaking about how youth engagement could be uh, related to coastal and ecosystem-related work. Uh, and we'll have a bit on uh, what our experiences is and uh, working with stakeholders uh, who are here also on the panel that we worked with. So it's, it's going to be a great uh, session, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and with that, I think we can go straight on to uh, the speaker presentation. So the order of speakers that I have is uh, firstly, Dr. Turney, uh, followed by Mr. Lucas. Um, and finally, we can uh, end that with uh, Ms. Voshita as well. So over to you, Dr. Turney. Um, thank you, Dinit. And uh, let me share my presentation with you and uh, hope you can see my presentation. Yes, we can see your presentation. Thank you. Super. So um, today I'll be discussing about the main marine and coastal issues uh, we are facing main, uh, on regard uh, to climate change. And um, actually, Sri Lanka being an island nation and just uh, you know located five degrees north of the equator, we are very much privileged with you know having the tropical environment, and therefore uh, all our coastal uh, waters. Uh, we are uh, tried with lots of uh, you know coastal ecosystems and uh, living coastal resources. Uh, for example, if I start from the from the very basic of the uh, from the very very, very uh, the land, we are, we can start with the sand dunes. And again, these are some sand dune vegetation uh, and sand dune resources we are having around the country. At the same time, uh, then we can find uh, in between water and land uh, interface uh, lots of. Uh, 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 mangroves located uh, uh, covering all the uh, 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 well, uh, lagoons and estuaries. At the same time, um, then we can move into the next uh, uh, ecosystem that's called uh, um, uh, our shorelines. Sh uh, shore is another ecosystem we come across and various types of shores depending on the location of the country. If you do not part uh, some different type of shores, but lots of papers there, but what you saw here is uh, from the from the uh, down south with uh, sun, sea, and sand uh, a combination. At the same time, then if you go to the uh, water from the from the shoreline, you will uh, find lots of sea grasses uh, in the most of the places. These are, these are sea grass from down south, but if these are sea grass from uh, western and northwestern part, and those are very shallow and very bit turbid and uh, with uh, some murky waters. And and then uh, if you go further down uh, with sea grasses, you will come you we, we come across coral reefs and, and we are we used to have uh, lots of coral reefs uh, tried with uh, marine diversity and with corals and all marine uh, uh, biota there, but still uh, uh, that remained only for maybe a couple of several decades ago we had that, but now after that uh, with El Nino and after uh, the several you know, thermal uh, uh, bleaching events, we lost lots of corals and again um, uh, on, on the top of that, uh, Pollution and fisheries, and 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 uh, and again, um, uh, more climate change. Uh, you know, issues uh, uh, pound on them, and, and we lost lots of corals uh, uh, by now. And these are our coral reef profiles. Uh, just to give some give some ideas about uh, how uh, you know uh, vivid they are and how you know beautiful they are. And again, if you go further down, and and uh, lots of land birds that's it on the pelagic water column. So these are the uh, very uh, very basic uh, idea about our marine life in uh, around Sri Lanka, and again on the bottom various uh, substrates, uh, bottom sub bottom dwelling animals. Then uh, it comes to climate change. You know, climate change is uh, now we are we are observing climate change. Uh, these are some definition for the climate change. You know, um, because of the climate change uh, from the ocean environment, uh, especially the reefs, 
the 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 uh, were the, the most uh, vulnerable uh, ecosystem that hampered by uh, those climate change impacts and again in the world level is about 30% uh, of already severely damaged because of that and again close to 60% may be lost by 2030 that's a prediction we are having but for the moment uh, there are no pristine reefs uh, left in our world they are somehow uh, one way or another they have impacted maybe by climate change or maybe some fisheries and other anthropogenic uh, effects those are the impacts of climate change melting of ice caps you don't have them but we are now fake, uh, facing lots of storms very frequent storms and at the same time number of tornadoes that's a very interesting point because uh, earlier during our childhood maybe two or three decades, decades ago we didn't have any record about tornadoes but now we are experiencing tornadoes crossing uh, our coastal waters and, and run, running into our inland waters and again ocean acidification is one of the issues we are facing and uh, severe droughts, long droughts, and floods, and again, uh, flash floods. Those are the new you know, scenarios we are, ex we are experiencing. And again, um, uh, very high sea surface temperature, and that prevails for a long time, you know, giving us a uh, you know, kind of shock for the uh, coastal coral reefs, and again, uh, to uh, uh, sea grass meadows there. So uh, we faced uh, uh, major coral bleaching event in 1998, uh, the first global event, and 2010-2015, lots of uh, uh, you know, bleaching events we uh, Sri Lanka experienced. And uh, at the time, if you see look, this picture, this is a kind of, kind of coral pinnacle we call it, but this is not like this, this, this coral colon is to totally dead. But for, for, for layman, this, this looks very, very you know, beautiful and uh, very, very uh, vivid, and, but still uh, those, these are dead corals because of the thermal stress. And this is what happened in one of the reefs uh, within one year time, this from December, uh, December 2017 to December, uh, September 2018 uh, period. So you can see within a couple of months, uh, uh, months time, uh, the coral reef dropped uh, about 6% uh, from these two. Uh, on the right side, you can see the, the picture before and after how they died and then started covering with the uh, uh, and in a turf algae. So these are the species specially uh, 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 perished at that time, but still uh, some species like uh, uh, one species called Montipara equicubal uh, uh, data, that population was remained unimpacted. It's, we sometimes we call this species as a weed, but this species did not get uh, much uh, effect, uh, but other species like Acropora, Pavonoporitis, and Goniopara, they all, you know, uh, disappeared from this reef within uh, two or three months time because of the thermal stress. And these are some uh, thermal stress signs from uh, one of the uh, highly diverse uh, marine parks, uh, marine uh, parks in the in, in north uh, northeastern part of the country that is called Pigeon Island Marine uh, uh, Marine Park. So from the top you can see uh, all are bleached, but, but at the same time you can see some. Uh, 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 healthy or maybe um, undamaged Montipora colonies also coming, uh, you know, still surviving among them. These are again uh, bleached uh, Acropora from the same uh, um, uh, marine park. But again, uh, then we received a huge amount of, you know, nutrients and uh, others through flash floods. And at that time, the turbidity goes very high in the waters and water becomes so murky and, and and lots of high amount of nutrients we record. And because of that, we, we, we observed, you know, high amount of uh, higher growth rates for sea weeds. And then ultimately this, the, the seaweed overgrow all the available corals. And, and then ultimately uh, uh, we observed that uh, most of coral reefs then converted into uh, algal bits that we call them, we, we normally call them as a ecological shift. So you can see if you take a closer look how helimeda are coming through corals and, and, and will, with the time this helimeda will totally cover up uh, this whole area, mainly because of the, the high amount of uh, nutrients uh, level we observed coming through uh, flash floods to these uh, coral reef areas. And at the same time, uh, through our record, you observe reduced reduce stocks of herbivore again, you know, uh, help uh, 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 in, uh, expanding these uh, algal uh, uh, beds in these areas. Uh, and again, uh, disappearance of these kind of uh, coralivore fish from this area, again, uh, 
uh, we observed with, with uh, once this coronary convert into alkyl bits. And uh, sometimes we observe this kind of words, this kind of you know uh, tumors and cancers you know occurring on corals. You can see from this picture unusual growths. Uh, nobody knows the reason for that, but still we are observing this sort of unusual uh, growths on some you know uh, corals in, in in our waters. And these sort of uh, high uh, excess uh, um, uh, slime you know, uh, secretion from corals. Here you can see that this, this colony is again covered with uh, filamentous algae, and they start uh, you know uh, releasing uh, air bubbles, and, and the corals also start releasing um, the uh, slime. So this slime catches all the, uh, the air bubbles, and you can see this sort of you know um, this this picture is from uh, northwestern part of the country. This from uh, Bar Reef area. And again, uh, outbreak of threatened species, uh, especially uh, Drupella attacks, and again, uh, and these are the Drupella. They expand very fast. At the same time, uh, very high expansion of sea urchins. So still, there's no link for the uh, for the expansion. No reason for the expansion. Some some predict some some uh, speculate that uh, especially the high amount of nutrients uh, they have relation to this. Uh, uh, the outbreak at the same time, others speculate that uh, because of the climate change and high high uh, amount of uh, temperature impacting on, on, on their uh, reproductive patterns. And again, ultimately they become, you know, more uh, uh, spreaded in these reefs like this. So once they are there, no fishing, no tourism is allowed because of the danger, uh, physical danger they cause to the, the reef users. Uh, because of that, uh, the whole scenario for the coral reef, uh, I can show you very simply like this. Because, because before 1998, we had very uh, lavish coral growth in our uh, shallow waters. But uh, before tsunami uh, in 2004, this uh, what happened, uh, we lost some after you know 1998 uh, bleaching event. And after tsunami, uh, they they washed all the dead corals and and uh, you know created the dead coral uh, you know uh, dead barren lands without you know enough. Um, uh, live corals. So you can see the uh, phase shift from uh, 1990, before 1998 and after tsunami. And if you go to the go to the most of the trees in down south and, and again western area, you will see the the third phase of the reef. And still there there are a few uh, um, you know the coral uh, new uh, settling corals, but most of the places uh, you look like this. And again, uh, the spread of crown of thorns. Uh, 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 starfish again evident because of this, especially uh, that is uh, has very good uh, higher link to the nutrient levels. So we had to uh, organize a, num a number of events like uh, underwater cleanups and 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 run of thorn collections and remove them from the area just you know ensure better coral reef in most of the you know uh, marine parks especially. Then with that we observed a high amount of erosion unexpected and, 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 and erosion and, and and we observed erosion some in some areas we never had such a you know history of past history of uh, erosion those are the new developments so those were very very huge very, very uh, severe erosion and sometimes uh, uh, the sea took about 500 meters uh, of land area within within a couple of hours time uh, such a huge erosion uh, we observed within last two years time. Because of the erosion, the loss of uh, sediment started suspending, and you can see on these bottom pictures, uh, loss of sediments are settling on corals, and again, uh, killing them uh, by uh, um, covering everything by uh, sediment. Uh, is called uh, that. Uh, that same phenomenon is called smothering. So smothering is very much uh, prominent in most of the uh, reefs in Colombo, mainly because of the high amount of sediments coming through uh, canals and again high amount of sediments coming uh, generate through uh, sea erosion and because of this uh, these are the uh, our restoration efforts uh, uh, mipa we, we have conducted in, in down south and in northeast coast uh, mirissa and kayankani reef but uh, we have to put high effort uh, you know keep them alive because of this uh, high pressure because of the thermal uh, high thermal level and again high amount of nutrients and, and sediment levels and high amount of turbidity so um, uh, those restoration efforts are most of the times fails uh, because of these uh, environmental impacts, but still we, we try to push them towards the deeper areas and, and uh, try, to, uh, remain, uh, try to protect the remaining, you know, uh, the, these uh, 
propagated corals uh, uh, without dyeing them. And then next issue we are facing is that uh, if I move away a bit away from climate change, uh, it's about pollution. You know, the most of the pollutants, about 90% uh, of pollutants coming from the land-based sources. So, you know, in the world, uh, we uh, normally, uh, we added about, at about nine, 8 million metric tons of uh, solid waste uh, to the sea annually. But in Sri Lankan situation, these are some beaches around, uh, this from Nigambu, and this is from uh, Kalambu. And this is from, uh, uh, you know, this one is Vallavata, this is from uh, Crow Islands in Colombo. And annually, from our estimates from 2017, uh, uh, 17, it's, it's about uh, kilogram, 33 million kilograms per year of solid waste are, you know, accumulated in our, on our, our shorelines, right? They come and settle on our shorelines, mainly uh, through our waterways. There's a huge amount of, uh, solid waste, 32, 33 millions of, uh, 33 kilogram, million kilograms, right? And these are the uh, actions uh, uh, you kind of uh, 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 see uh, taken by other countries, but these are, these are, this is what we have done to stop this uh, 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 solid waste being added to, to the sea. Just we have established these are kind of strainers, we call them as strainers. This, uh, we established number of strainers in Trincomalee. And again, this is what we did in Colombo with the Hivala Canal, across the canal, to uh, gap, uh, collect or strain all the, you know, floating garbage at this point and then remove them. Main task is to, you know, uh, 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 stop their, uh, this garbage being added to the ocean. So in this case, uh, lots of private agencies and, and, and other, other private companies, they supported us and, and, and uh, and now our, our next task is to spend, uh, spread this uh, this uh, technique to other uh, canals first, and then go to rivers, uh, depending on the the support we are uh, receiving. And then we uh, started new uh, project called Beach Caretaker Program. This is, a, this is the Beach Caretaker. So we have allocated this beach beach stretch for for this person. So through uh, private companies, we pay him for his uh, uh, for his day to day work. For per day, he has, he has about two hours to walk up and down, collecting all the only plastic, right? So then we arrange some sort of uh, uh, recycling companies to collect this plastic from these people, and they again they can earn some money. And for this purpose, uh, we select uh, the poorest families from this area. And at this uh, before COVID, we had about 120 of these beach caretakers. It means 120 kilometers we kept maintaining uh, on daily basis. And, and at 120 families we supported. But after that, everything collapsed. But now, by now, again, we have about uh, almost 100 uh, beaches now. MIPA, our agencies, uh, keep leading to the, to the support of uh, um, uh, private, uh, private companies. And at the same time, we support about almost uh, 100 families to this process. We call them as beach caretaker program. These are, these are some examples. This is from Nikambu. This is from Gold Jungle Beach. And this is from uh, Mana. Kiri Beach. So this is how they clean it. On the other hand, this is a place earlier from North Western province. On the other hand, we do very frequent beach cleanups. We you know that beach cleanup is not a solution for uh, this beach pollution, but still, just to keep our beaches clean, we are in number of beach cleanups, and our, our staff is very much you know accustomed to that. You can see how they clean before and after, how they clean up, clean beaches within a couple of hours' time, and, and we have all the but still, for this, we take the support of school and again uh, uh, the forces uh, to you know get uh, to support us and we arrange sometimes weekly program to keep our beaches clean. These are some examples. This from Slack and Trust we did uh, in uh, in Colombo uh, few uh, in last year. And not only that, uh, some uh, diplomats also joined us. And uh, beach cleanup has been some kind of you know uh, viral uh, 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 activity. It's spreading very fast, and I mean, we were happy. We are happy that we were able to establish this uh, the whole concept in the country. And again, uh, then if I, uh, I move to uh, fecal pollution, uh, the liquid pollution, Sri Lanka is uh, our waters are very much polluted from from uh, liquid pollu pollution, especially fecal matters. Right? Uh, we have two canals in Colombo. You can see from Google Earth. Uh, this is from Colombo. It's about two kilometer canal, just pump uh, raw sewage to the waters. The length of this canal is, uh, the pipe is about two kilometers. And the, the flow rate is about uh, 340, uh, 340 liters per second. 
so it's it's kind uh, it's kind of like uh, it's a, like this sort of this is not from Sri Lanka but this sort of you know emission is happening from this space you can see the the plume uh, even from the Google images also that coming back to the Colombo waters this again uh, a huge problem we are facing not only in Colombo most of the cities most of the coastal cities they do this do this they pump raw sewage or sometimes uh, partially treated sewage to the uh, coastal waters and again oil and uh, 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 chemical spills to various, you know, uh, ship uh, accidents. This is what happened uh, very recently uh, in, in again, closer, closer to Colombo. Uh, it's again a filthy business, but still uh, it caused a huge amount of damage. And then again, to go to restoration, again, I can move into uh, mangrove restoration. So we are, uh, we, we do lots of mangrove restoration around the country. Uh, with the support of SLIC and also support us and lots of agencies now working with us. And we, re uh, we restore uh, once degraded mangrove areas and for that uh, we use mangroves and mangrove associated uh, 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 plants again. We have established some mangrove nurseries for that, uh, our own nurseries, for that we, we, uh, we train local people and, and we pay them. So lo local people get the ownership and local people get the awareness about the mangrove protection and mangrove conservation and they, they actively engage in mangrove conservation. So these are the projects available with us and people can join with us and, and support us and, and at the same time to establish a proper mangrove areas because our mangroves are breeding very fast mainly because of the tourism industry and again some fisheries and because of, and because of some uh, 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 development projects proposed by you know some government and, and private agencies. These are the pictures from mangrove restoration we, we have done in, in uh, northern region. Not only us, but lots of uh, communities, they support us. And, and, and again, to you know, commemorate some, some important days, uh, such as a mangrove, uh, International Mangrove Day, International Coastal Cleanup Day, and again, uh, International Environment Day and International Ocean Day. So we, we for commemorate those, uh, we arrange these sort of programs. And this is what we are doing for the moment. Uh, and uh, I just want to show, uh, say in very brief that uh, we have very, very tried once with once uh, we had a once tried environment, but it's now degrading because of anthropogenic effects. On the other hand, because of climate change effect, but still we are we try hard to you know, restore them through lots of restoration programs. For that, we need support. We need support from local and from region and from overseas level, and and. Uh, we keep uh, all our uh, doors open for anybody to work with us. And, and, uh, and we have the technology and we have the know-how. Somehow I request all of you to get together and, and, and do this uh, and to just to you know, protect all our uh, uh, you know, very valuable and, and high diverse ecosystem just to, uh, for the sake of our future generations. And that's all from me. I will be available for the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Turney. I look forward to um, asking you a few questions myself as well. And I can already see that uh, in the chat box, we already have a few questions lined up. Uh, this is also just a kind reminder to everybody that uh, you can um, uh, 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 drop your questions in the Q&A, uh, in the chat box, sorry, um, as we go along, if you have any questions for the speakers and we'll be taking uh, those uh, questions after all of the speakers have uh, given their presentations. So um, next, I would like to call uh, Mr. Lucas to uh, give his presentation. Thank you. Thank you for showing us some of the very interesting, um, very interesting ecosystems, which um, are locally being taken care of and some of the challenges. Um, in my pres presentation, I wanted to get uh, take a step back and take a little bit more of a risk angle towards these challenges and also talk about how we can use these ecosystems to um, tackle climate change as well as increasing the disaster risks around the world. We all know that disasters have become more frequent and more intense during the past 20 or 30 years. And we're just um, 
ending a decade of devastating disasters around the world. We've seen fires in Australia, California, the Amazon. We've seen enormous floods in China, Bangladesh and India. And around the world, we have had enormous heat waves. And um, especially coastal areas are impact, increasingly impacted by disaster risk. Um, and some of the underlying issues and drivers of this risk are related to reducing poverty, um, badly planned development, but also degrading ecosystems. And um, today I wanted to focus on degrading ecosystems. And I wanted to just emphasize that in coastal areas around the world, there's about 25% of all people um, living which is 1.9 billion people and around 40% of the global GDP up is produced in coastal areas. And just by the end of this century, we would we'll potentially expect to have around one meter of sea level rise. So um, there's enormous, an enormous challenge ahead of us. And um, yeah, but, but not being negative, um, I think we have also, we have to say that we've made an enormous progress in reducing risks and moving from just managing and responding to, to disasters towards um, prevention. And um, we all know that, that nature is kind of um, the basis for our lives and we all depend on nature in different ways, whether um, we, we, whether we look at agriculture or different other sectors, they all depend on, on, on nature. And in 2009, the Stockholm Resilience Center kind of um, lined out different planetary boundaries. And at the core of these boundaries, um, they, they named biodiversity, which underpins our life by regulating the climate, but also providing ecosystem services. And I think this concept is really powerful to not um, look at nature only at something that is around us, but also to look at it as a solution which we can use to tackle some of the problems which are ahead of us. And um, ecosystems, biodiversity and disasters and climate change are strongly interlinked. Um, as we lose our ecosystems, um, they are further, this, this process is further fueling um, climate change um, because we, we kind of lose our buffer of, of regulating the climate. As we have more and more frequent and more intense disasters, this in turn is also kind of um, further reducing the ecosystems we have. But, um, and that's where this concept of nature-based solutions originated from. Nature-based solutions is kind of um, making clear that we restore ecosystems, but also in a way that we tackle some of the challenges we have. Um, and um, there's different nature-based solutions I wanted to talk about, but also but focusing more on the coastal ones. Um, just behind me, you can see already one, which is a wet, uh, an urban wetland park that was created in Colombo, not only as a kind of park for recreation and people being able to move in, but it also serves a critical purpose of um, regulating floodings in Colombo by kind of being a natural buffer for heavy rains. And in addition, it's not only a buffer for floodings, but it's also a rich source of water. So kind of this wetland park is kind of an ideal um, example of a nature-based solutions. But there's also many other solutions. Here you can see kind of the wetland parks, but in coastal areas, um, coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrass are, are the most important ones. And um, kind of raising awareness about the importance of these systems is one thing, but kind of making sure these are sustainable on the long term is a very challenging issue, I'd have to say. 
last year, I conducted research for my master thesis um, in cooperation with Slycan Trust in Sri Lanka. And um, I wanted to kind of do research and find out on how we can make use of mangroves to tackle disaster risk, but also how we can kind of involve many different stakeholders in, in supporting restoration of mangroves conserv and conservation of mangroves. And um, by doing so, applying this concept of nature-based solutions. And to be honest, I found it quite difficult to, um, to talk with, with different stakeholders, in particular the private sector, which I looked at, um, to talk about um, how these, these ecosystems relate with them in their daily business. And I think this is kind of um, a challenge we all have to have to look at. And um, something I found really useful is kind of um, using art as a method to kind of um, to kind of show different actors their relation with the environment, but also showing them how they can use nature for themselves and for sustaining their lives. So um, something I created during my research is this illustration, which shows a coastal environment and puts emphasis on mangroves, corals and seagrass as nature-based solutions, which help us to kind of tackle some of the enormous challenges we have in coastal areas, which are erosion, sea level rise and coastal storm surges. And, um, all of these ecosystems I named kind of up natural buffers against these disasters. But as there's no kind of impact of natural hazards, these are also very important for sustaining our lives. And um, in the illustration, I kind of show different ways of how we can use nature. For instance, um, mangroves are important for fisheries. Um, mangroves can be important for tourism by um, people going into mangrove forests um, if they are accessible as mangrove parks, by people doing bird watching tours. And at the same time, mangroves do not um, benefit tourism, but they benefit fisheries, they benefit local communities, and many others. So I think. Um, Something I wanted to highlight is that um, kind of um, it's on us to kind of uh, reach out to, to these different stakeholders and together kind of work together to make to sustain these ecosystems and um, keeping us this safe space and this natural buffer, which will help us on a long term to to live with climate change. Um, and I wanted to end this presentation just with uh, saying that I've seen already on the project proposals which have been developed during this conference and which have been put online some amazing um, nature based solutions already. There's a project on seagrass, um, there's one on mangroves, and there's many more on kind of on ecosystems. And I wanted to encourage you to kind of when reaching out to different um, stakeholders, if it is uh, children, women, communities, youth, um, the private sector, to make sure to not only let them understand the importance of these ecosystems, but also to show them positive ways of how they cannot degrade ecosystems, but how they can really make use of them to um, to have a sustainable life. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say here in this presentation, um, I, I'm just um, pointing out a few further interesting um, products on nature-based solutions, which I'd recommend you to have a look at. And um, I'm afraid I have to leave kind of this, this conference in five minutes and will join later today. Um, but please, if you have any questions, reach out to me via email or, or I'm sure kind of um, the conveners of this conference will make sure to kind of follow up on all of your questions. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, uh, it's a shame that you can't join us for the uh, Q&A session. I had a few questions lined up for you as well, but um, uh, we'll definitely send you over. We'll email you any questions that um, any of the um, attendees have today. And um, we look forward to uh, engaging with you in uh, the next few sessions that we have coming up as well. So thank you. Thank you, um, Dinetra. Thank you. Um, so with that, I think um, we can go on to our final uh, speaker, Ms. Voshita Vijay Naika. Um, so I'll hand it over to uh, you to uh, wrap up this section of the event. Thank you. Dinetra, since uh, Lucas has to leave and he has five minutes, um, maybe you could open the questions for uh, Dr. Turney and uh, Mr. Lucas uh, before oh. he leaves. Yeah, you can sure, start with yeah. Lucas. Um, Dr. Turney, if you're okay, we could have the questions for Lucas for five minutes and then we can take the questions afterwards. Is that okay with you? Perfectly. Thank you for this um, suggestion. Yeah. Um, is that okay with you, Dr. Turney, as well? Yeah, go ahead, because I also have the, my, my board meeting starts at four o'clock. I have to get, get ready for that meeting, therefore, better to okay. you know, throw me my questions. Okay, sure. So I'll start off with uh, some that we have um, in the Q&A, uh, in the chat box, sorry. So the first question is by Dennis, and I think uh, both Dr. Turney and uh, uh, Mr. Lucas can uh, answer this. So what happens underwater is invisible for most people and no one really owns coral reefs or the oceans. How can we create a feeling of ownership and responsibility and motivate people to conserve and restore marine environments and ecosystems? So maybe Dr. Tani could take that followed by uh, Mr. Lucas. Yeah, actually the, 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 the underwater, underwater world is uh, very, very much alien to lots of people. So there's a problem we are having being an island nation. You know, lots of people, when I talk about the underwater world, it's totally unaware for them and what is happening underwater, even huge disasters like uh, uh, bombing and even dynamite fishing and even uh, bottom set when I when I discuss those uh, issues with them, it's, it's totally alien for them and they don't have any clue what is happening there. So that's why we need, you know, lots of school uh, kids and, and others, you know, to be thrown into the ocean and get, you know, get used to the ocean environment and start turning about the ocean. Because once you start diving and once you start snorkeling and once you start that as a hobby, I know that nobody will come, uh, nobody, nobody will deviate from that. On the other hand, you can learn a lot from this whole environment and, 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 and you can even create your own, you know, own your lifestyle, you know, livelihood through it. Therefore, through my agency and through my you know, career, I always <clears throat> try to take people into the ocean environment, try to train them. And uh, within the last couple of months time, or last of years time, what we did was <clears throat> we had a special program for media people to tra train 50, me uh, 50 uh, media pe personnel and take them to the uh, ocean and uh, teach them underwater, uh, you know, uh, photography and snorkeling and even show some underwater uh, marine life. And uh, we train about uh, three batches of such uh, media groups. Now they are the people, they, they take the, you know, voice to the uh, to the whole, uh, you know, country at the moment. And that's why you, you see lots of uh, media uh, uh, events uh, and lots of media uh, <clears throat> publications is now you now slowly emerging uh, based on especially based on the ocean environment therefore uh, i think we need people we need more people to, who can really work in the environment ocean environment and for that the country should have a better plan you know teach them swimming and push them to the ocean and try to you know let them take the experience so because of uh, at the moment since that is lacking in the country so even though the even if the ocean is dead nobody's no uh, there's uh, the, the nobody's known. Uh, nobody know about that, and still, those information are not trickled to the real situation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, uh, from our side, we do all the do everything to you know aware and train them people, train people, and 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 give them real the, the feeling of your. <clears throat> so that's what we are doing for the moment. 
Thank you for that, Dr. Tony. Um, I quickly have also uh, one question for Lucas. Maybe he can uh, answer before he leaves. So, uh, you know, I've done a bit of uh, research on uh, nature-based solutions as well. And, uh, you know, I can see that it's much more beneficial for both uh, coastal communities and um, ecosystems themselves uh, compared to, you know, using gray structures and stuff, um, especially, you know, uh, protecting against floods, um, uh, uh, cyclones, etc. So I think uh, you touched upon the fact that we need to promote awareness for this and uh, um, so I just want to ask you what how do you think we can engage youth in um, uh, in these uh, you know creating awareness and also for them to uh, get involved in these east ecosystem conservation projects as well mm -hmm. yeah it, it's, I think this also links to Dennis's question because often the problem is that um, that not everybody is kind of very nearby and has the ability to kind of go to these ecosystems. But I think um, there's many ways youth can engage directly or indirectly. So you do not always need to, to go to these places and, and plant mangroves or trees, but you can also engage through raising awareness, but also kind of mobilizing a funding, for instance, to support some of these things. And um, I think youth, the youth is really a powerful actor in kind of um, uh, reaching out to many stakeholders, um, not only putting pressure on them to acting on the environment, but also coming up with with interesting solutions such as, I don't know, I've, I've seen kind of um, initiatives that, that kind of sell products such as a chocolate and um, the profits in turn being invested in reforestation. Um, there's there's kind of an initiative on Instagram called Coral Gardeners, um, which is a group of youth in the Caribbean, I think, who kind of um, collect money from people who who agree to adopt a coral, and um, in turn they can kind of um, fund their um, coral conservation hatchery. And um, so I think um, youth are very creative and there's many ways for them to engage. Um. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Lucas. And I know that you have to uh, leave us uh, now, but thank you again for uh, contributing to our session. Thank you, and, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to stay in touch. Yes, thank you, me too. Um, right, I think, um, if it's okay with uh, Dr. Turney, would it be uh, possible for us to uh, go on to Ms. Worshitha's presentation and then uh, take on uh, take a few more uh, Q and A's before we end the session today? Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Turney, you're on uh, mute. Sorry, uh, Dr. Tony, you're on mute. Sorry. I, I have my board of directors meeting starts at four o'clock, uh, and, and before that, I can and join. But uh, after that, I won't be able to stay here. Okay, sure. Uh, our session ends in, uh, I believe, in another ten minutes. So, would you be able to join us for another ten minutes? Okay, no worries. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Miss Voshisa for her presentation. Hello. Um, Yes, I'll quickly go through the presentation I have. Um, I think I'll skip a lot of stuff because we already discussed these aspects. Yeah, so I hope you can all hear me and see the screen. Uh, what I wanted to focus on is how um, youth could engage in coastal ecosystem and um, how to conserve it and restore it and link it with the climate action that can contribute to uh, conservation as well as rest uh, restoration. So, um, yeah, so we can do a lot of things to conserve uh, ecosystems and we can connect it to climate change as well. Um, some of these have been mentioned, so I'm not going to discuss it, but in the next sessions we have, we'll be talking about disaster risk reduction and also biodiversity. And most of your projects were focusing on these aspects. So I think uh, in this youth forum, we have a lot of aspects that connect to the work that um, relate to coastal ecosystems. And some of the threats that we in our work as I can trust address relate to um, the climate impacts such as sea level rise um, and then flood and storm surges, 
uh, increase in temperature and most of uh, so loss of biodiversity and ecosystem. So this is this is a list that works and then also livelihoods. Um, so we focus on sustainable development in the work that we do addressing climate risk and disaster risk, um, as well as other contributing factors that would uh, enhance the risk, like for example, waste management issues and also um, people's livelihoods being lost. Um, and then we also engage youth in these activities and we make sure that the work that we do is multi-stakeholder driven. Uh, as Dr. Tani mentioned, most of our projects or actually all of our projects are partnering uh, in the activities with them uh, and other actors as well. So these are a few project photos that you can see with multiple um, stakeholders in different areas. So this is in Jaffna, the previous ones, um, for those who are familiar uh, to Sri Lankan geography. Um, and how can youth engage in uh, coastal and um, other ecosystems that relate to it, marine ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, and also biodiversity? Um, so you could all, um, contribute to creating awareness of ecosystem services, conservation and restoration, uh, and then be a voice for conservation and climate action because you could initiate projects, you could take um, different kinds of activities that would bring attention to uh, the need for conservation and restoration. And then you could be a owned, um, the project could be an owned project by youth, uh, like the projects that you have submitted already. Um, and then you could focus on capacity building other youth through different kinds of workshops, group activities, um, training processes, modules that you develop uh, with other partners who have the technical expertise. If you do not have a lot of it, uh, you can build your own capacity um, to ensure that you spread the message to other youth as well and also how we can sustain interest of those who are working on this activity, so including youth as well as other actors to work with you throughout. Um, and so technical support and finance and training for youth action. So that could connect with a proposal, for, for example, that you submitted where you connect with organizations that could partner in the process that you want to implement and also contributing to policy processes. So what I want to highlight is how national and international processes connect with uh, the coastal and marine ecosystems and biodiversity. So under the UNFCCC process, we have the Paris Agreement, we have other different programs that relate to biodiversity and ecosystems. Uh, so if you take specifically the Paris Agreement, there's something called the nationally determined contributions where the countries are making commitments and we could have mitigation adaptation commitments under this for the marine and coastal sectors. And similarly, national adaptation plans, um, so that's something a lot of developing countries as well as developed countries are developing at the moment. Um, so these could connect with coastal sector and marine sector. And then also work of the Narabi work program, which is under the UNFCCC, uh, which is focusing this year on biodiversity and uh, oceans as a key theme. Um, so this is something people could connect and contribute to. It's focusing on knowledge management a lot and stakeholder engagement, data related to the sector, um, and support provision. So how GCs could uh, be accessed for funding and how countries and different actors could engage with these processes. Uh, and then sustainable development goals. You have localizing of these targets that's happening in some countries, for example, in Sri Lanka, this is happening, as well as SDGs would have a component that relates to these sectors as well. Um, so coming back to youth, how can you engage in these processes? I think we discussed this. You could engage as uh, a youth uh, representative uh, as part of youth NGOs that are working, uh, Yungo, um, or you could connect with another organization that works with this. You could work with your government, you could be uh, advocating for inclusion of youth in the sector's work or generally climate action which connect to these processes. Um, so I'll quickly park um, if you have any questions, maybe the questions for Dr. Tani could be taken and then I would be around today and tomorrow. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ms. Washita. Um, so I'll start off um, with a few questions that we have for Dr. Turney. So um, uh, I see that in the chat box, Prasadi has asked the question, um, is coral reef restoration effective and successful? And I think maybe to add on to that question as well, maybe um, maybe uh, some of the plans that NEPA has uh, in relation to uh, coral uh, reef restoration and uh, conservation as well. Yes, uh, coral reef restoration is a bit tricky, if I if I would say, because uh, first, uh, if you do it, definitely you, you should know about the basic ecology of corals and biology of coral and basic uh, the ecosystem dynamics, uh, uh, especially in the, in the area you are focusing. 
and then uh, with that backup definitely you can uh, you can start uh, you know uh, doing the color restoration but uh, it automatically it normally comes with the experience you know i, I also started color restoring uh, restoration uh, maybe more than 15 years ago uh, uh, collecting you know few coral uh, the uh, pieces you know uh, uh, broken by fishermen so with that time, uh, with the time I, I experimented with some methods and then somehow I observed that if you uh, have an education, if you have enough time to uh, look after it uh, within the first six months time, and, and uh, you can do it and at the same time, you can gain experience uh, on, on coral restoration. But on the other hand, uh, 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 especially the, the, the climate changes again, you know, very much impacting on color restoration because uh, if you do it uh, uh, in very shallow areas, so you will lose all the corals within a couple of weeks or months time soon as the temperature changes. Therefore, uh, the depth also matters. Therefore, you should have some, some sort of idea about the depth range and, and the, you know, the temperature contours, how this temperature changes with the depth. So with that background, uh, uh, you should start with uh, uh, start color restoration, if not without uh, that uh, basic background and without basic experience, if you start a, you know, some sort of, you know, larger color restoration project, uh, definitely you are not going to restore the ecosystem, but still you are going to destroy it, right? But uh, restoration does not mean that you transplant corals, but still you can do uh, coastal cleanups and reef cleanups and you can remove some, you know, depending on the place, you can remove some algae and allow corals to come and settle their coral larvae to come and settle. There are lots of things you can do, but uh, for, uh, especially in the coral case, you should be well uh, uh, thorough with the coral ecology and the biology of corals. Then you can think of doing that. Uh, if you start a coral restriction without that, that basics, uh, I advise you to, uh, advise you not to do it. Sorry. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Sani. I think um, adding to that, um, uh, what you said as well from your own experience, how do you think youth, ex youth engagement has been in these conservation and restoration projects? Have you seen, you know, active youth engagement or would you like to see more or how do you think that this could be, you know, developed for uh, future restoration and conservation projects? And also maybe touching on the importance of youth as well in that aspect. Yeah, actually, youth is a very, very, very you know, a very productive and very, very, very uh, uh, potential group we can definitely touch on, especially when it comes to marine conservation. So, if they come come with some sort of swimming background and if they are very much comfortable in the waters, definitely we can take them directly. But if not, we have trained them for some time and at the same time give some basic idea about the marine life and the ocean environment and basic oceanography. So. Uh, I uh, personally like to work with them if they are willing to join with us and, and, and learn about this and, and if they are have enough time to, you know, to get the training about marine, uh, about the swimming and, you know, if they are more comfortable in the water, uh, I think that's a, one of the major, you know, uh, uh, trust group we, uh, we can capitalize on. Yes, I agree as well. And I think, um, I think uh, MIPO would look forward to having uh, more youth engagement as well as uh, uh, I've heard from your uh, presentation as well. And so uh, maybe we have uh, time for one final question, which can go to go to both participants. So my question really is on, um, you know, ecosystem conservation in relation to uh, international processes such as the uh, nationally determined contributions and also the national adaptation processes as well. How do you think that, you know, ecosystem conservation, do you think it's been integrated well into these processes or do you think that uh, there's room for improvement? Um, so, yeah. So let was the answer first, and then I'd follow her. Sure. Um, so youth engagement in the NDC and national processes. I think, um, like, I, I think some of you joined yesterday. Um, Fleur mentioned how um, action for climate empowerment links with youth work, and then how NDCs could connect with it. Um, and in and in some countries that we work in, we work in Africa and Asia in different countries. There are also um, strategy processes that make. Uh, youth engage in climate action. So these initiatives could connect or um, facilitate youth to be part of decision making processes. And this youth forum that we've been having for the last five years is part of such a process in Sri Lanka as well, where we engage different actors, including the government and climate change related entities to engage. Um, so the international ones, of course, you can always be part of the UNFCCC process. Um, 
the youth NGOs and all that I mentioned. Um, and technical capacity building would be important for you to effectively engage. So do reach out to technical experts who could help you with that and people like um, who are engaging with us today. Uh, and during the three days would be very happy to help. And also the mentorship program we have would also turn into these activities. So um, Dr. Tani. Uh, now regarding this NDCs and others, I think uh, if, if the youth engage in that, I, I still uh, I, I prefer if they if the youth uh, if they have a better idea about what is happening at the global level at UN level, if they can have a better idea what is happening at that level, they can definitely engage from from locally. But if they engage locally without having what is happening for what we are doing, what is NDCs and, and what are the purpose of that and what is SDGs and uh, uh, how is this formed and 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 uh, uh, how everything is happening at the UN level, what are the UN agencies and how they work, work, work closely. Uh, if they don't have such an idea uh, uh, of the real, you know, mechanism there, then if, then when, when they enter into the system, they are they, they can do something, but they don't know where that is really linked to the real, you know, system. So I think uh, that that link is missing in the most of the places because youth, they, they are very much new and, and they don't have any, uh, they have, but they, they, they need much experience. But people who are really engaged in NDCs and uh, at, at, uh, those uh, those reporting and, and, and process, they are very much accustomed and they know what is happening and, and that link is missing. So with that understanding, if the, if the youth is engaging in that, definitely uh, it will work. But uh, if not, definitely it's our duty to tell them where they are and what they are doing and, and for what they are doing, we have to uh, aware them. Then we can uh, take uh, much more from the youth uh, from the youth group because they have all the technology and they have the, all the, the capacity there. So we can do it in, in more aggressive way. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Tani, I think you need to leave, but just to add to what you mentioned, I think uh, that's where the technical capacity building plays a role. Um, but also it's, I think, important in the stakeholder consultations that we have at national level um, to have what you think about, um, whether they know the whole process in the NDC, uh, international processes, uh, whether like, I, I think the process being um, explained to them and them engaging is very important, yes. But also when we pitch something, because these would be commitments we make as a country. So if we say we are going to do this activity, the general opinion could be a basis for us to understand whether this is a good action, whether the national circumstances would allow this um, or not. So I think that is also useful for us to keep in mind um, about how we could engage different groups uh, to contribute to the NDC process. Because I feel like in most of the countries, knowledge about NDCs is low. Um, so we need to ensure that we uh, focus and um, target the youth groups to create awareness about the international policy processes and how national processes are linked to this. Um, and and this, this could be through online or in-person process review. Yeah. Okay, thank you for, uh, very much for that. Um, and I think with that, we can uh, end our session for today. A special thanks to uh, Dr. Turney, uh, Mr. Lucas and Ms. Voshita as well for joining us and being able to interact us, with us uh, in the Q&As and also uh, for those insightful uh, presentations as well. I hope that everybody could join us for the coming sessions that we have today as well as tomorrow. But uh, with that, I think um, I would like to uh, end the session and um, uh, bye for now. Thank you very much. Would anyone uh, would anyone like to have any final comments before we leave? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the time, Joanne. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Tani. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Bye.